Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jani Remy. I'm the Deputy Director at the Sridhar Thapal Center at the University of the West Indies. And my co-host today is Ms. Renata Amaral, Adjunct Professor at American University. And today we will jointly be hosting this dynamic discussion entitled, A Woman in Charge, Challenges and Opportunities for the new WTO Director General, Mrs. Ngozi okonjo oweria I, I will be calling her Ngozi affectionately, and I imagine the rest of my panel will because it's just simpler. And she's the first woman to be celebrated and perhaps scrutinized at the head of the WTO. It's no secret that her task will be heavy to rehabilitate the function and the reputation of the WTO at a time when it is at perhaps an all-time low. But in this month where we celebrate women, we wanted to find some way to honor her and also to perhaps cast some thoughts and light on the scope of the task she faces, wondering and debating whether a gendered view does or does not cast any light or provide any meaningful insights about her task ahead. What do we know about Ngozi? Well, she is the seventh director general of the WTO. She took office in March 2021 and there by became the first woman and the first African to serve as the WTO Director General. And Gozi is a global finance expert and economist and international development professional with years of experience working in Asia, Africa, Europe, Latin America, North America. She was formerly the chair of the board of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. She headed divisions at the World Bank, twice Nigeria's finance minister, mother, wife, Wonder Woman. What we do know about her, since she's given quite a few press conferences and interviews as well, is that she has said she will prioritize vaccines during her stint, that she wants to reestablish the relevance of the WTO in areas, for instance, like fisheries, dispute settlements, and she also wants to make some advancement, some of these new areas like investment facilitation and e-commerce. Uh, but it hasn't been easy for her getting to the top. We know there was some blocking of a nomination and she's had some negative press. What lies ahead for her and what advice this panel can give her is going to be the subject of the next hour of discussion. And with me to have that discussion are four women leaders in trade in their own right, none of whom are short of ideas or enthusiasm, I'm sure, for Ngozi. Let me introduce the panel quickly. Ms. Lisa Schrutter is the Global Director of Trade and Investment Policy at Down, and currently the President of Women in International Trade Trust. Jennifer Hillman is currently Senior Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, a professor at Georgetown University, and former member of the WTO's appellate body. Annabel Gonzalez is a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington, D.C., and host of the ever-popular Trade Winds. She herself is a former director of the World Bank and a minister of trade in Costa Rica. Finally, Professor Padide Alai, who is a law professor at the American University, and she herself is a director of international and comparative legal studies and a faculty director of international legal studies program. So they will be leading off on the questions that Renata and I will be posing to them. Just a word to the audience, if you would, throughout the course of the discussion, enter any thoughts or questions that you might have over the next hour as you listen to these ladies. We will bring them up and incorporate them in our discussions with the four panelists. Let me hand over now to Ms. Renata Amaral, who will start the discussion going with a suite of questions to all of our panelists. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jen. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I don't know where you are in the world, but I have to say the first thing I would like to say is that this is my dream team, including my co-host. So I think these are all fantastic women and uh, we are very privileged to have them all together today. Uh, so I would like to start with a very quick question, maybe yes or no answer to get the ball, ball rolling. Each of you ladies, you are leader, a woman leader in the field of international trade. 
have you personally uh, and in your professional experience felt prejudiced, disadvantaged because of your gender? Maybe Lisa, would you like to start that one? And then we go the four of you. Yes, unfortunately, yes. But there's two ways to look at that. You can look at that as a disadvantage or you can look at that as being undervalued and taking advantage potentially of those around you who aren't listening to you to create more opportunities. So there's always two ways of looking at that. Yeah. Annabelle? Um, so I would probably say uh, yes and no, uh, but the approach I take to this is, you know, that whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yeah, that's true. Jennifer? You're muted. I think you're muted. Yes, um, I, I apologize. And I'm going to sort of echo a little bit of what both colleagues have said, because uh, I do think it is, what do you do about it? Uh, and for me, it's, I came out of law school, I'm old enough, when there was a not insignificant number of men who literally could not hear a legal argument if it was expressed in a female voice. So you learn to write instead of speak. Uh, again, I, I, I sat through many, many a meeting, as I'm sure every woman on this panel did, where uh, you're, you express an idea, not much gets said. Two minutes later, a man exposes the exact same idea, and all of a sudden, it's great. And again, you learn over time to have the confidence to say, thank you, John. I really appreciate your um, supporting and reiterating my idea. Thank you. So again, I think it is what you, what you make of it. Excellent, excellent. And my dear director, Padide? Well, I would have to say yes. I started off in a law firm at the time 30 years ago when wearing pants was an issue for partners who talked to me. So um, yes, things have changed quite a bit. Um, I also would say that I had a combination of being a woman, but also having somebody with the first name or last name that you couldn't really pronounce very well. So there was a, it, it was a gender price plus sort of ethnicity. Um, and probably certain stereotypes that go with that. But um, areas make a difference. I think there's been a big change. Um, I started in the banking sector, the financial sector, and I would say the banking sector is one of the hardest areas to break into. Trade is actually easier, international trade, um, especially in the government. We, I think we benefit women benefit from the fact that the government has been more open uh, to women in senior levels, and then from there to private corporate, corporate America. But um, I will one time I like to regale my students about my my uh, my experiences as a banking lawyer in the 1980s. Excellent. Um, now I have some uh, four questions uh, designated for each one of you, but please feel free to comment on each other's answers. Uh, we really would like to make this very interactive. It's Friday, so please feel free to join, to jump up and uh, and. Uh, enjoyed this this event. Uh, so Annabelle, trade and gender agenda at the WTO. Uh, reflecting a little about trade and women's agenda at the WTO and bearing in mind the work of the World Bank, the ITC and other international organizations on the forefront of trade policy, what can we say has been achieved and how much is left to do? So thank you very much, uh, Renata. Um, I'd probably like to start by uh, highlighting the important uh, role that trade can play in improving uh, the living conditions of uh, women through increased jobs and wages, access to better jobs, um, and, uh, and reduction of cost. And this, however, as long as the barriers that prevent the full performance of women are removed and that our appropriate policies are adopted uh, to mitigate adjustment uh, costs. So a recent World Bank report confirms that companies involved in international trade uh, employ more women. They're also better represented in companies that are part of uh, global value chains uh, in, in countries like Morocco uh, or, or Vietnam, for example, women represent 50% uh, or more of the workforce of, uh, of uh, exporting uh, companies. Uh, trade increases women's wages and economic equality, and there's plenty of evidence to this. 
trade creates better jobs for women, reducing uh, informal employment, uh, and trade openness uh, also increases the well-being of women uh, by reducing the cost of the products in which they are highly represented as workers, or in which as head of household, for example, um, they direct consumption patterns, such as in food, for example. So, I think a very important issue to highlight also is that empirically, uh, it has been shown that countries that are more open to trade, uh, understood as the relationship between trade and GDP, tend to have higher levels of gender uh, equality, more access to education and skills, better conditions, et cetera. So I wanted to sort of bring this a bit of a background to our discussions because I think uh, this, is, this is very relevant. Now in 2017, WTO members uh, and observers approved the Joint Declaration on Trade and Economic Empowerment of Women, a first collective initiative to increase the participation of women in trade. Uh, and even with over, I think 120 or maybe more uh, members backing this uh, statement, the issue has not really become, uh, as of yet, a critical priority for, for the WTO. Now, for sure, WTO rules are gender neutral, and there's been a, an interesting study in this regard, and they do not stand in the way of members uh, pursuing policies to empower women through trade. But there is, of course, much more that could be done in terms of finding creative ways um, for members to help themselves accountable uh, to providing equal opportunity for women and, and men. And let me just uh, quickly mention one area, which I would then uh, would probably want to, to mention throughout the, the, the uh, our discussion, is that is of trade facilitation. Because numerous studies um, have found that women are particularly vulnerable at the border, uh, due in large part to disproportionately low levels uh, of literacy and access to information uh, and rules and uh, procedures, uh, along with uh, intimidation practices um, often implemented through bribery and corruption. So prioritizing the digitization of customs procedures will help um, mitigate the harassment of uh, women at the border. And hence, you know, a, a, a stronger trade facilitation agenda in this regard uh, would be particularly uh, relevant. The other point I would like to briefly um, highlight is the importance of aid for trade uh, initiatives uh, and capacity building more broadly uh, on strengthening capabilities of women for participating in trade. So let me stop here, uh, Renata, as an introduction and thank you very much again. Thank you. Does anyone would like to comment? No. Uh, I think one 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 thing that uh, that came to my mind, uh, Annabel, uh, listening to you, is the is that we need really an effort maybe now on the implementation, right, of of gender provisions in those in trade agreements, for example, that Canada, Chile, and other countries have been including gender chapters, gender gender provisions, but. What I'm missing from what I see is how how do we implement this, right? How how do do we get the ball rolling on the implementation? So <laughs> maybe that's something we can discuss later. Liz, I would like to turn to you. Uh, currently, we have uh, three head of trade organizations in Geneva that are women: the World Trade Organization, the ITC, and UNCTAD. Is this a sign that the trade and gender agenda has come? of age, others, it, it in fact mask uh, more deep-seated problems still to be addressed and overcome? What do you think? Renata, it's such a great question. And thank you again for the chance to be part of what I know will be a very dynamic conversation. You know, it's interesting to me that, you know, we're very fixated on this. So we've got three women leading these amazing organizations and incredible leaders in and of their own right. And that is something that is very, very much to be celebrated. But the fact that we do have to celebrate it as something odd, unusual, or unique, that's what we really have to, that's one of the things that we really have to focus on changing. Madeleine Albright tells a great story of once having a conversation with her young granddaughter who knew that her grandmother had been Secretary of State. She'd seen in her short lifetime Condoleezza Rice, Hillary Rodham Clinton. She actually turned to her grandmother at one point and said, are boys allowed to be the Secretary of State? You know, how do we start to create the dynamic where a woman leader is in an unusual circumstance? We're really not just focusing on who they are, but what they're doing and the accomplishments, the leadership, and some of the unique elements that women leaders can bring to the table. 
And I think one of the things as you talk about it, if there are more deep seated problems, I really think the fact that we see so many amazing women being elected, appointed or voted into these positions demonstrates how much we have empowered each other as a community. You know, the fact that uh, you took the initiative, you and, and Yanni Yip, to pull together this discussion. You know, what you've done, Renata, to start Women Inside Trade in Brazil to bring the community together. What uh, Jennifer was just describing about how we help each other have a voice at the table so that when a woman makes a suggestion, the other women at the table are reflecting that and, and not just waiting on you to back up your own idea, but yeah, Jennifer, that was a great point. You see a lot more of that going on in the community and uh, the organizations that we're a part of. And I think that really reflects how we're helping each other be successful. Whatever level of leadership we're deploying, um, it allows us to demonstrate to your point about the implementation, how do we also demonstrate the success and the fact that women at the table are driving real progress, especially on what has become a conflicted trade agenda, but it's still one of the greatest areas of opportunity for us to really, particularly coming out of the craziness of this whole past year, how do we really drive a fair and inclusive global economic recovery? Excellent, Thanks, excellent, Lisa. Um, I remember when I got, when I arrived in DC, I think more than two years ago now, uh, and you you taught me this, like we have to agree with each other in a meeting, just reinforce the other like point of view. And I think this was very meaningful for me since I, 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 I listened that from you in the beginning of my DC life. So thank you so much. So you talked a little bit about the WTO agenda and I want to place a question to Jennifer Hillman. Uh, Jennifer, what are the major hurdles uh, faced by the WTO today? Uh, bearing in mind the positive accolades being best of on women leaders during COVID-19, do you think that uh, there is a certain quality of female leadership that equips Ngozi to be better placed to steer the WTO away from crisis? And uh, what are what areas do you think uh, uh, she can be most effective, critical in uh, affecting change? Jennifer, you, uh, yeah. Sorry, thank you so much. Really a great question. Uh, and for me, uh, to me, the, the major problem at the WTO is that it's out of balance. Uh, you have you know, the legislative arm, the rulemaking arm, the negotiating function, if you will, that has basically been non-functional. I mean, you've had only a trade facilitation agreement reached you know, ever since the Uruguay round was completed in 1995. So it's just not working. You then have the sort of executive branch, the secretariat, which is incredibly competent in terms of the skill set of those working there, but they don't really have any power to get as much done given that it's this member driven organization. And then you have the dispute settlement system, which until the United States killed the WTO appellate body was perceived as being very, very strong. But overall, again, the system really out of balance. And to me, one of the things that, that Dr. Ngozi brings is this sense of balance and how important it is. And, and to me, I, I, I know three things in her background that suggest to me that she gets it in terms of how important it is to try to restore this balance. First, I, to me, I don't think there's any doubt that she understands how important it is to work for gender parity you know, at the WTO and in and supporting the member governments of the WTO. I mean, not just for equity's sake, but because it gets you better policy outcomes. I mean, if you, if you look at all of the studies that have been done, I mean, women are just more likely to advocate for what we would call in the US bipartisanship, but I mean, more likely to argue for a balanced approach, um, are more likely to drive investments in areas like education and health and, and again, and trade uh, that are again, more empowering over the long haul to women. Secondly, to me, I think it is really important that she has that Gavi connection and really does understand the disproportionate impact that COVID has had on women. Uh, I mean, honestly, the fact that women make up 39% of the global labor force, but accounted for 54% of the pandemic related job losses. I mean, if you look in the United States, 80% of the 1.1 million people who've dropped out of the labor force are women. 
uh, you know, again, India, you know, two and a half times as many women are the ones that are withdrawing from the workforce as men. She really understands that part of this fighting the pandemic, part of this having the WTO play this critical role in terms of, you know, getting the vaccine distributed fast and fairly, uh, getting medical equipment and goods out there and making sure the WTO plays an affirmative role in that. I think she she totally understands how that is also important important for women. Now, the last thing I, I think it's important, um, you know, Annabelle commented on this study out of the World Bank, and I, I again I commend it to, to those that really want to understand these issues of women and gender. She comes to this position with a knowledge base about how important women and trade and looking at that issue are. I mean, I remember just. You know, telling stories, you know, way back, um, I played a tiny, tiny little role um, in the lead up to the Beijing Women's Conference. So this is, you know, 25 years ago uh, when our first lady, Hillary Clinton, was off uh, to make a really path breaking statement about women's rights being human rights. Um, uh, in Beijing, they asked, they called over to USTR and asked for information about the impact of trade and trade agreements on women. And I, it was assigned to me to try to do this. And I'm telling you, I looked, 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 and there was nothing. It was not thought about. It was not cataloged. It was there, there was no, you know, sense that trade had any kind of a disproportionate or proportionate impact on women. And you now fast forward uh, to to now, where we have so much information. A lot of it again cataloged in this report that Annabelle is describing. That really makes me believe that she understands at her core uh, what, what trade and trade agreements can do uh, to improve the lives of women. And so all three of those things to me suggest that she's got what it's going to take to try to restore um, a better balance within the WTO. Excellent. I totally agree. She's super equipped to deal with uh, all these issues at the WTO. Um, so to finalize this first round of questions, I'd like to uh, ask Padide. So Padide, bringing back uh, to basics, uh, Ngozi has made it clear that trade is about people. How does a woman of color, the first of her age, and ethnicity bring more of a unified, inclusive approach to trade problems? Does her presence alone signal positively that the considerations of developing countries will be better addressed in the future WTO? I did it. Well, thanks a lot. I want to underline a lot of what was being said, especially what Jennifer said and Annabelle before about uh, her understanding, given her experience and who she is the gender issues that, that are at the core, the equity uh, issues that affect all of us. It's not really about women. It's about what will benefit every, everybody. So trying to see this just benefiting women, I think is wrong. It's, 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 it's for the whole. Um, uh, I mean, looking at her and her background, there, I do believe there's some virtue. I, I want to be where Lisa's grand, uh, well, uh, well, Madeleine Albright's granddaughter, as Lisa was saying, it is where, you know, it's, it's, it's neither here, men or women, it doesn't really matter. They're, they're claiming that it's not unusual for women to be in these positions. But the fact is that it is unusual. And uh, we can't forget the history of the GATS. And, um, and I also, as, as in the gentleman's club, although it's changed a lot over the time, and, and, uh, the fact that she is an African and she's a woman um, and she, she, she embraces her Africanness, I think is important. There's something symbolic about that. But is that an end in itself? I mean, it doesn't really, having a woman in charge doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have issues addressed that are, uh, you know, that are helpful to women or, 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 or promote gender equity. But in her case, you know, building on what uh, Jennifer said, uh, Dr. Nagosi does have 25 years of experience as a development economist, right? She had oversight over World Bank's $81 billion operational portfolio in Africa and South Asia, Europe, Central Asia. Um, and then, of course, her job as a minister of finance in Nigeria, one of Africa's largest economies, uh, spearheading the negotiations with the Paris Club of Creditors. It's not easy. That led to the wiping out of $30 billion of Nigeria's debt including outright cancellation of 18 billion. Uh, her second term as finance minister 
Uh, she did attempt to do a lot of enhancing uh, transparency and strengthening institutions against corruption. Um, she actually, um, I did not know, not only showed grit, but she, her, her, even her mother were apparently, for what we understand, was uh, kidnapped during to de uh, you know, the deep vested interest. So this is not somebody who's scared of anybody. And so that is, that is, that is a good thing, yeah. Now, the, the problem is that the role of the director general, I think at the WTO is not a defined mandate. Um, you could be Pascal Lamy, who I think had a more strong personality and had his own views on how things should work. Did that succeed particularly? I think the United States frankly was probably not, um, not as open to the US position or uh, Roberto Azevedo, which seemed to have been uh, shifted more into a super secretary, maybe in a way, beholden to member states. Um, I don't know how she sees her role. What endears her to many is how, you know, she's, as uh, it was meant by uh, Vera Songwe, um, uh, who works with the UN, UN Economic Commission for Africa, is that she has seamlessly been able to encounter the problems um, in, in different parts of the world and what we all share because of her lived experience. So I am curious to see how she, what, what, how she will define the role of the director general, right? In this, in this new institution. I don't know, and I wanna ask this question of, of Jennifer. I don't know what her views are. She has stated that dispute settlements need reform. I think we all agree it needs reform, but I don't know what she means by that specifically. Um, so we can talk about that in a little bit. I also want to talk about the fact that as women, when, when women, so when I was, uh, I, I don't want to digress, but when I was uh, in, in law school, I wanted to study an, an area and it, it was suggested, Islamic law, and it was suggested that I should study family law. And I took that as, as, as relegating me to areas that were women-centered. And for those of us, who it's, it's the old gender bias. If it's a woman in charge, maybe it's less important. And I wonder about attitudes towards that. Um, the glass cliff that somebody has talked about. When things are really messy, when nobody else wants the job, let's put a woman in charge so that she can take the blame uh, if things don't work out. Um, I have read reports of saying that, you know, now we have a 66 year old grandmother in charge of the WTO. What kind of a description is that? Is that a description that you would ever hear a man get about being a grandfather? So one has to, I'm curious to watch, to see whether um, is, we will be, whether having a woman in charge, uh, how it's going to be viewed. I, she's definitely given a very difficult task at a very difficult time, but I definitely given her background, I don't know her personally, she seems to be really um, able uh, to address these challenges. Excellent. Thank you so much, Paride. I would like to call Janine now to, for the second round of questions. And uh, we are seeing the questions in the Q&A. We are going to try to accommodate them till the end of, of today's seminar. Janine. Thanks for, yeah, thanks, Renata. I mean, I, I just picking up on what Paride just said, I don't remember, and in my time at the WTO, I don't remember anybody interrogating the background and the uh, the reputation and the color and what she's wearing as much as we find ourselves in that hair. And I wonder if that's because of the crisis we're in, right? So it's just the fact that we need somebody and so people are really, you know, looking to see in their background what they've done and how they've treated the crisis, et cetera, and that necessarily in involves a more, you know, intrusive approach. Or if it really is because she's a woman um, of color and it's the first of her kind. And so there's so much digging into who she is as a person. I, I, I don't know what the answer to that is, but it has struck me as, you know, being quite a, a lot of the, the time and the discussion is about her. I think it is also that she's an outsider. Right? She wasn't a, per se, a, you know, a, a trade person that we had seen in the trade field. So. I think there's so many little, uh, uh, lots of reasons for it. I just wanted to react to that. But going back to something you mentioned actually, Padaday, which is this press um, about um, her being a grandmother. 
Um, and I'm going to pick on Jennifer a little bit here um, and ask her if, if it would be fair to say that the types of challenges that Ngoz, Dr. Ngozi has encountered in her lead up to, to ultimately being selected, we know that you know, there was some problem with her um, nomination in the US, former US administration. And yes, there were some unfortunate references in the press, her being a grandmother. What do these reactions you think say, if anything, about whether there's a bias and prejudice to women's leadership in international organizations and business? Is there anything you think we can glean from that? Well, what, what I will say I do not think is that the Trump administration, because again, I do think it's important to know that it's the former administration, but I do, I do not think that their sort of last minute blocking of her in favor of uh, again, and, and it's important to me in favor of another woman, uh, you know, Minister um, you from from Korea. I don't think that says anything about her gender. What it does say to me is that the Trump administration did not want to put forward someone that came from what they would call the globalists. I mean, you know, she, it was more her background um, as a leader at the World Bank, you know, very closely uh, working with uh, Robert Zellick, who I think at least some in the Trump administration regard, again, as too much of a free trade globalist. And so I think it was more the concern about that rather than her gender uh, that I think at least drove drove the Trump administration to to do a, a, a blocking. And uh, again, it was it was uh, to me very last minute and and very uh, not very well done in the sense that there was no attempt to really build a coalition um, for an alternative. It was just simply block. Uh, so I, I I don't read very much into that. Um, but what I, I do w agree with entirely a lot of what Patti Dai has said, which is we're at a really perilous moment for the WTO. I mean, it is in a very serious state of crisis. Uh, and I think, you know, if she cannot, uh, and again, I, I would not disagree. I mean, we're, we're asking the world of her. I mean, we're putting... Uh, a, an almost insurmountable amount of pressure on her uh, uh, to, to, again, to pull, you know, um, something out of the, the growing, you know, again, and it's getting faster in pace, the degree to which the WTO is sliding uh, into effectively irrelevance as an institution. And here she is being handed this job of stopping this, you know, downhill slide uh, from occurring. And so to me, it is a real challenge. Uh, and again, I would say it's a particular challenge to, to those of us that are lucky enough to be women in leadership positions to find ways to be supportive, uh, again, to be that voice saying good idea, good idea. Um, and I think to try to give her encouragement that she doesn't have to be just a sort of listener caretaker uh, at the WTO, that she needs to be a bold leader. Uh, again, if you look at, at how the WTO leadership structure works at some level, um, as Lisa had said, there's no mandate for this job. Uh, and various director generals have, have been more willing to, to put their ideas, their proposals, their recommendations to really knock heads to try to come to a conclusion. And others have regarded it as a member-driven institution. Every idea comes up from the members. You know, I'm just here to, you know, make sure that all the right people are in the right, same room at the same time, and then I have no role. You know, again, she's got to find that middle ground uh, between not being so domineering and top down that she turns off those that don't agree with her. And uh, at the same time, she doesn't have time to just put everybody in the room and hope that something good is going to bubble out of that room. So, again, I think it's incumbent on all of us. Uh, to really support her um, and encourage her to find that way, that third way, as she's described it, you know, of, of, of being in that middle place where we really need her to be in order to really lead the WTO. I just wonder before I go to the next question, if there's any reactions among the other panelists to anything that has been said by any of your fellow speakers, because there's some really interesting points coming up here. Um, so feel free to jump in. Um, I do have a question, though, if there's no one else who wants to take the floor to Annabelle, which is, you know, there's this idea that there's a gender and trade agenda that is elitist. I mean, we're here talking about women in trade, but it's the leaders in trade. These are like women like yourselves who've actually made 
um, quite a, a great career and it's about empowering women leaders and even economic empowerment seems to be the bias of the gender and trade agenda as we're seeing it. How do we ensure that really the campaign addresses issues for all women, not the privileged like ourselves, but those who are actually, you know, in, in our countries, working in these informal sectors, caring for kids, um, you know, dealing with the everyday realities of being disadvantaged, and, and that certainly is is is, is not is, is not a, is not a, a a dream. It's a reality. So, how does the gender and trade campaign be inclusive and not elitist, so that we don't steer people away from what we're trying to achieve by focusing on economic empowerment and these kinds of discussions that really are us privileged women? So I, I would have to say that, you know, women represent 49.6% of the global population. So promoting an agenda that aims at leveraging the power of trade for the benefit of uh, half of the workforce is, uh, uh, or half of the population, I'm sorry, it's not elitist by definition. Um, now the devil of course may be in the details in particular on what the content of the agenda uh, may be. And I would like to um, say a few words about uh, women in, in poor countries in particular, based on a report, uh, which I think is a, is a great report that, um, that the WTO and the World Bank did. Uh, um, I, I was at the time at the bank and we looked into uh, trade and poverty, the relationship between trade and poverty. And one of the um, four big areas uh, that is relevant in this discussion is the role of, uh, of women. Um, and you know, if, if you look at this, uh, women in poor countries participate in trade in many ways. Uh, you know, they can be uh, a small scale cross-border traders, which is very common in, in Africa, for example. They participate in the production of traded goods and services, ranging from rural cotton farmers uh, to textile workers, for example, in large parts of uh, Asia as well, to professional activities such as legal and accounting services. And of course, they can be also entrepreneurs uh, owning uh, exporting uh, countries. Uh, now, while women face common problems, uh, and I will refer to this, uh, there are specific barriers, of course, depending on the sector in which you are. Now, the reality is that gender gaps have limited and continue to limit the ability of women to benefit from trade opportunities. And this is particularly so uh, in the case of the poorest countries. Again, for instance, uh, in some places in Africa or South Asia. Uh, and some of the issues that they face um, are, you know, are, are common across, uh, across sectors. Uh, so with lower levels uh, of, uh, of education and less training, uh, women producers and traders face more constraints in accessing overseas markets uh, than, uh, than men do. Uh, and again, all of this is backed up by uh, evidence. Uh, this is, for instance, in the case of agriculture, where women farmers uh, do not have necessarily access to improved seed and fertilizers uh, to, um, uh, to raise yields, uh, or they may, it may be more difficult for them to comply with complex border procedures uh, and uh, to deal with uh, some of the uh, behavior and extortions that uh, happen in some of those borders. They also, um, related to this, uh, not only they have greater constraint in accessing overseas markets, but they face greater risk when trading across borders, as I have been uh, mentioning. Uh, there's also, of course, time constraints uh, as a result of an even distribution of responsibilities in the household. So any additional requisite that is uh, added, uh, you know, to, to be able to export or to import, then has this disproportionate effect on, uh, on women. They've also been, women have been excluded from traditional male-dominated distribution networks. Uh, they have limited access to finance and face restrictions on ownership of land. And the list goes on and on and on. So this is not to say um, that all these issues are relevant for all women in trade, but it is. it also means to say that uh, there are uh, different elements that can be addressed to make sure that more women can participate in trade. So in no way, I think it can be said that this is an elitist agenda. It depends very much on what the content of the agenda would be. Thanks, Janine, can I can I add just two two little points because I, I to me two sort of interesting thoughts. One is again buried in in this same World Bank study. It, it is really interesting when you think about um, again the developed countries. Where are their highest tariffs? 
they tend to be on the products that women purchase. Uh, you know, again, if you think about it, if you, um, and again, the numbers are, you know, that, that women spend a larger share of their income on goods with high tariffs. What is that? That's food, that's textiles and clothing, uh, that's, you know, ceramics, that's, got, I mean, you look, uh, and it's not just the United States, this is generally the products with high tariffs are the products that women buy. The other flip side of it, too, if you think about what's happened in the United States, where we've had, again, the Trump administration going to bat for the steel industry, for the aluminum industry, for the aircraft industry. Um, have you heard them say a word about going to bat for the textile and clothing industry? Uh, they employ more people than the entire steel industry and the aluminum industry combined in the United States. Uh, there's more imports into the United States in the textile and clothing area, and yet Again, the policies, and it's not just the United States, it's elsewhere, oftentimes, the policies that are touching on the need for trade protection, if you're gonna call it that, um, are very, very skewed to protect male and male dominated industries. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, it go, it's on both sides where I think there's no question that in the application of trade policies, we have seen a, a very strong gender bias. That's really interesting because it's the way you present these statistics, it seems like there's a, cons it, it might seem like a conspiracy, right? I, I mean, but in fact, I don't think anybody goes and fights for one industry or another thinking, oh, this is predominantly male, uh, do you know, dominated, etc. How do we end up in these cycles of trade policy where it continues to be that there's this dis disproportionate impact? So that's, these are really interesting things, but you can't sit down and think of a, huge policy making machine rethinking yeah let's let's promote men at the expense of women so it's it's interesting to see the statistics i just guess it, it begs the question of how how we fix it um well, go if, ahead if i may uh, jenny if i may just say one word i think one very important aspect of this is the issue of uh, voice um and uh you know if uh, what is the voice of women uh, in in trade, uh, and uh, I think that the points that Jennifer were, was was making before, she's absolutely right. Uh, and I think part of it at least can be explained uh, by a weaker voice, um, uh, you know, of women in in trade in representing their their own interests. So so there you go. I think if I could, I'm Jean Yu. I'm just going to add to that, and I think Anna, that was such a great point um, because, and I know one of the questions that's come in over from the audience is about, you know, more informed or inclusive decision making. We really need to think about that. How are we just deciding on the issues to begin with? The more inclusive we are at the table, the more women have that voice and can raise many of these, what Jennifer was just describing in all of those statistics, you know, these are things women know because we're paying for them or we've had that challenge. And we need to be able to bring those at the table so that as we're defining the issues to be addressed, the information, everybody has that same understanding so that we get much more inclusive decision-making going forward. It's what Jennifer was talking about before too, as we think about supporting and encouraging, we're focusing a lot on these women leaders, but remember that there are women all throughout the WTO. Many of us on this panel have been involved in different WTO issues or jobs at some point in time. You know, as we think about how we encourage all the women within the organization to have that voice, to take the seat at the table, to bring that information forward so that we're focusing on the right issues and getting to the right path forward, that's going to be a really important part of the process. How we support the current leaders that we have and build that next generation as well. Yeah, I, I like this. Please go ahead. No, no, no. I would just would say, um, you know, the whole thing is about is about reciprocity. We negotiate things, right? We give up some things for other things in trade negotiations. And I remember us giving up our, our textile sector um, back when we, when we China's accession to the WTO. I remember this was one of the things that we decided was. So these are negotiations we make. And so thinking about the consequences and who and what gets hurt. Um, I think, as you say, it has to do with inclusivity and, and, and being aware of the consequences and the impacts early on. Yeah, I, I think I'm, these are really all great points. I think I'm actually going to go to some of the questions um, now so that we, we don't alienate our lovely uh, audience. 
Um, and I'm, I'm going to start with a question um, about the future. Well, no, let me let me ask the, the one that keeps coming up with this, this idea of a backlash. Right. So Christopher Worrell asks, how do we respond to individuals who say that there's a surge in women's leadership? And women are trying to dominate, right? And, and this comes inevitably, the subtext of this question is, it, it comes somehow at the expense of men, right? So how do we promote women and at the same time not sort of give up on this idea of having an equally participative um, organizational setting? So how, how, how do you react to this thing that women are moving ahead and leaving, in a sense, dominating and leaving things behind? others behind. Any reactions to that question? Go ahead. Let me just, uh, Ashani, I'll take that up as, as sort of a, a quick question. This, I think, kind of plays into Dr. Ngozi as a leader um, and being able to take that position, not as a backlash to anything, but being the right person for the right job at the right time. And hopefully, as I hope every day, very much not a glass cliff situation. I mean, one of the reasons or one of the great values that she brings from my perspective um, is the fact that, and I don't know if this is a feminine leadership characteristic or if it's due to her finance background, but there's a practicality to her agenda. And I think this is one of the ways where we start to avoid the backlash is if instead of focusing on sort of what, you know, appear or creating a systemic issue, um, we need to be talking about how this agenda is about growth for everybody. And yes, there's a women's empowerment angle to that because how can a world grow when you leave 50% of your population behind? You can't. Um, and certainly certain parts of the world, certain industries will suffer for that. But if we make this about that common effort to growth and practicality in terms of how this benefits everybody, it gives us the chance to really demonstrate that it is about leadership, not gender and being able to get things done. And I feel like Dr. Ngozi, especially with her finance background, you know, that's an element she's bringing back to the WTO. As Jennifer was talking about with balance, you know, one of the other things is we really need to demonstrate the opportunity for the WTO to lead and be successful. There has not, other than the TFA, been a real closed negotiation in years. You know, we've seen the disruption in the dispute settlement body. You know, when all of that isn't functioning, it's a lot harder to build support for an organization. They're not doing anything. Um, but bringing a practicality back to the agenda where we can demonstrate, you know, women's empowerment is about helping economies recover after COVID. You know, generating that wave of economic activity is good for every community and every gender. I think that's something that we can really look at. That's a leadership trait we need to encourage, empower, and build up the organization around kind of driving that agenda because that's what gets everybody back to the table. That's what gets people to commit when they can see that there's a win coming out of it. I mean, what's the tangible success story? Economic numbers, growth, job creation. Um, that's the kind of thing that creates a lot of um, enthusiasm and engagement from the entirety of the community. And hopefully that's something we look forward to seeing Dr. Ngozi bring to the discussion. Thanks, Lisa. I, I want to pick up on one. Can, you, can I just add really just one really just really quickly, because to me, the other aspect of it, I totally agree with everything Lisa just said. But the other part of it to me is to is to, again, for all of us involved, don't let it be framed as a zero sum game. It is not a zero sum game. It is not if women win, men lose. I mean, and there's so much evidence to support that what I've just said, because it is very clear that when you have more women in leadership positions, the policy outcomes are better for everybody. Uh, and again, it's not just in the trade space. If you look, my, I've got colleagues at, at the Council on Foreign Relations that produce this Women's Power Index, and it's very clear from their data that having more women included in leadership within countries you know, within national legislatures, et cetera, does a lot of important things. It definitely increases just stability. I mean, female representation in legislatures, it's associated with, you know, again, decreased risks of civil war, less human rights abuses, less interstate conflict. Uh, so again, it's not a zero sum game. And, and so I, to me, it is important to remember that having more women in leadership positions, again, across a lot of arenas, actually produces a better result for the men too. Yeah, good point. Uh, and that's statistically true, right? Um, because women are such nubs of activity. They generate so much 
you know, in, in the household, and that spills over to so many other things. That it's hard to see it as just a win for women outside of the context of the, the broader socioeconomic environment in which they operate. There's, there's two questions that I'm going to try to combine. Um, and we have 10 more minutes. So, but this is this, this question about Africa. I mean, it is, and Gozi is from Africa, and, and Africa is getting a lot of play in terms of its importance, the AFCFTA. A lot of uh, preeminence in countries' trade policies. The EU names it a, quite a few times in its new trade policy. Um, is is there something to be gleaned from the fact that we have the first, you know, African Director General and uh, bringing African states back into the fold at the WTO? Is that something that is inevitably inevitably going to come out of her directorship? And somebody else in the chat says, how is any of this? going to help the poor women and girls in local towns and villages in sub-Saharan African countries, understood as some of the poorest parts of the world. So I just wonder if any of you have views on, on how her uh, you know, ascendancy is going to bring, in a sense, more attention to, to that continent in particular and, and the great opportunities we see with Africa being the youngest continent um, you know, to leaps and bounds ahead in the trade space. Anyone wanted to take something, take that? Annabelle? Yeah, I'd like to say something. Um, I First, I, I certainly hope so. Uh, I think there is very much an opportunity to increase the participation of African countries in uh, global trade. Uh, and I think this in turn would uh, drive economic growth uh, in the region. And I think there's an opportunity to do that in the context of greater participation in the WTO, uh, where hopefully uh, the agenda could also reflect uh, some of the interests uh, uh, and the issues that are of particular concern in the region, uh, like uh, like agriculture, for example, like food security, like all these issues of trade facilitation that I have been uh, that I have been mentioning. Um, and I think there's also a another um, uh, very important opportunity in the context of regional integration within Africa as well, and in particular uh, in the context of the implementation. Uh, of the Africa continental free trade uh, area. So I think the fact that the uh, director general uh, comes from that part of the world will help bring additional light uh, on the process that is already going on in terms of regional integration and could also help to um, foster trust so that um, uh, uh, African countries could also have a more active participation. I was mentioning agricultural trade facilitation, but I'm thinking also investment facilitation, for example, to bring investment into, into the region, uh, electronic commerce, uh, to be able to leverage some very great, uh, you know, some very successful opportunities uh, in, in Africa. I'm thinking about the role of uh, M-Pesa in Kenya uh, and, uh, you know, extending the use of mobile uh, uh, phones uh, to improve trade in agriculture. So there are many things that can, uh, that can be done and, uh, and I am very excited about her uh, participation because I think she will indeed bring light and she will indeed bring trust and hopefully this will help uh, um, improve the participation of Africa in uh, global trade. Thanks, Annabella. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I'm going to pose my last question to Pat today, which is kind of futuristic looking and I think it's also embedded in some of the questions that were asked, which is, um, you know, Ngozi is inheriting, and, and, and it has been mentioned before, this is a member-driven organization, but we know that given the ill-defined roles, that there's a space there for her to take the next step on both the gender agenda, but also just more generally, you know, seeing a path, a vision forward for the organization. Um, what do you think she should use that position to achieve? Um, not only because she is a woman, but in a sense, because she's new, she's a little bit of an outsider coming into the organization. What role do you see her in playing in really reimagining um, the, the role of the organization in the future? What should we look forward to? And, and I'll, start, I'll ask you, but I'll also invite the other panelists to give their view of what she should use this moment in history to do and to achieve. Padre? You know, it's, uh, I would, I will also, in my humble opinion, what I think she should do, because it's a very, as I say, we are, we are giving her a very difficult job, a tankless job. And I think uh, it's going to be, somebody is going to have a problem, whichever, whichever move she makes in whichever direction. 
I'm a person that is by nature cautious and I take things in incremental step. And I believe that devil is always in the detail. So if one can look into areas where there can be agreement to show some amount of success so confidence can be built up in the institution, in my view. Um, there are areas uh, such as, you know, she's worked on this global alliance for vaccine and immunization, this Gavi, I think it's an important move. There is a pharmaceuticals agreement. There are things that the WTO can do to increase its relevance to what's going on in the world. I mean, I would take something in, 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 in that area. There's also, um, you know, I think that the WTO has a potential to really have it have a say in the climate change debate. So I don't, to us, to some extent, can 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 that take can, can she move things in that direction? Uh, the fishery subsidies um, is another area where she has mentioned it, but I think um, um, given given the importance of uh, of also women in small scale fisheries, there's a lot that has been happening on on some on some regional levels in the U.S. MCA, and there's some mention of it in in the in the, in, the, in the other agreements like RAS, RCEP, but um, I think just showing some tangible movements. Um, I, I'm, I, I err on small, progressive, small steps. Although I do need, I do understand that with dispute settlement, there needs to be some kind of a consensus. And I'm hopeful that the United States will come to the table. And here I'll look to Jennifer for in sort of adopting some of the reforms, whatever it is, that uh, would be acceptable so that we can have a consensus on dispute settlement as well. But if you show little victories, little by little, I think things build up. Thanks, Pat. And Lisa, as you sum up, I, I didn't ask you the question and you're a woman of business. So if you could just throw that into the answer, that would be really great. Your, your view for her and advancing sort of the more commercial business oriented objectives. Well, absolutely. And I think it's going to build nicely on what Padita was just saying, because I think I also very much heard the word tangible. And I think that's an opportunity that Dr. Ngozi has is to rebuild the stakeholder community. I mean, she was there when we interviewed her for WIT last year. That was one of the th first things she talked about was to how to get more of that engagement. So there was more informed decision making. Digital trade is a perfect example. There's a lot of conversations around digital trade in the e-commerce vein. Digitization is also something that's, you know, a key factor opportunity going forward for a lot of traditional manufacturing. How do we bring all of those elements to the table so that we end up with the right policy that's about enabling the benefits of this technology, not inadvertently keeping uh, putting in restrictions that make it more difficult for people to be, for businesses, small, medium, and large, to be successful. You know, as we think about that agenda, you know, Petita mentioned um, trade in the environment. This could be a great home for the WTO to focus on, even with the challenges, you know, the, the lack of progress on an environmental goods and services agreement. You know, WTO really has the opportunity to remove barriers to technology that exists today that could deliver meaningful environmental um, solutions to key uh, communities. Water technology is a really good example. You know, everything exists now that we need to develop to, to ensure clean water for communities, but do, can we get the technology to the places it needs to be? WTO can be the leader in this space, even at a functional level. I wanted to go back to your point about, you know, as we think about Africa, you know, when you see the political commitment to something like a continental African free trade agreement, that's extraordinary progress uh, in a very short period of time for the African countries to come together. But what is the WTO doing to help them build up an agreement, you know, based on best practices that we're familiar with, with a lot of existing trade work to make sure that as that FTA comes together, it's really about development in Africa as they're trying to access not just the regional market, but foreign markets as well. If we rebuild the structure where they where we can really point to tangible ways where the WTO is bringing together the communities most capable of driving trade to align with those best practices um, and opportunities to drive a trade agenda that, that empowers these new technologies to make a difference, you know, we've never needed it more. And I feel like Dr. Ngozi, especially with her commitment to bringing those, bringing those voices to the table has the potential to deliver those really tangible results. 
Jennifer and Annabelle, I know we're at the time, but I do want to give you both an opportunity to round up and then I'll pass well, on. To I, I'll only say two quick things that I, I hope are, in essence, an, an encapsulation really of what I'm going to completely agree with everything that Lisa and Patty Dye just said. And that to me is, at some level, um, I think her task is to steer the WTO as it responds to two big shifts. Uh, one is that the sort of premise of the GATT and the WTO has been on non-discrimination, MFN and national treatment. To me, we're now seeing a paradigm shift to the point that the raison d'etre of the WTO has got to be sustainable development. And I say sustainable development sort of writ large, meaning uh, it, it includes environment, but it also very much includes sustainable development for labor. And that obviously would include women as part of that labor force. So that's one basic major sort of shift in paradigm of the WTO that she's got to manage. And the second is that we're going regional. I mean, whether we want to say this or not, but the pandemic and everything else uh, has meant that as everybody looks to try to figure out how do you make your supply chains more resilient, how do you build in more redundancy to them? How do you focus on even just the environmental cost of shipping things so far away? You're going to see an increased amount of regionalization. I mean, there's just no question it's happening. It's going to start happening even faster. And so then the question comes, how do you fold that move to regionalization into a global WTO? Uh, and so I think those are two you know, real big challenges that I think that she that she will face. So very quickly on my side, I, I, I agree with what has been said before. I would focus my um, recommendation to her uh, as to what she should do, I say deliver, uh, because there, uh, there are great expectations. It's a very challenging job. I think Patty did put it very clearly, uh, but she needs to deliver. And uh, there's an opportunity to do so um, in, a, in, a, in the next ministerial conference by November uh, with a package that is realistic, but that nevertheless shows that the WTO can produce results. And from there on, uh, establish a work program that so that some of these important issues that have been mentioned here uh, can be um, discussed and, and again, uh, with a focus on delivery. Thank you. Okay, so I think we are out of time. We need to respect the agendas of these ladies. They are all very, very busy, but we are going to post uh, the video in our website. And they are all very active in social media, so you can find them for further questions. I want to thank the audience for the engagement. We had a lot of questions. And I uh, hope we can regroup in a few months, maybe to talk about this again. This was wonderful. Thank you so much, panelists, my co-host, and audience. Bye-bye.